Okay, so in the interest of time, let's get started. Uh, my name is Sue Fastenau. I am the pediatric educator uh, for the CINJ and the inpatient pediatric oncology hematology unit. Um, I am pleased to present tonight, Mind, Body, and Spirit, a holistic approach to addressing your child's medication, nutritional, and psychological needs during treatment. Um, when we speak about treatment, I'm talking about treatment for anemia, treatment for sickle cell, treatment for cancer therapies, treatment for anything that you may see um, our hematologists and oncologists in our clinics and in our uh, inpatient settings. Um, I'm pleased to announce um, the panelists for tonight. Uh, the first three are our pharmacy um, participants, Jessica Lisi, Kathy, Catherine, sorry, Kathy George and Liza de Guzman. Uh, all three of these pharmacists work in our inpatient uh, pediatric oncology and hematology unit, as well as the general peds, and also work very closely with our pharmacists at CINJ. Lori Magulis is our registered dietitian. Uh, Lori helps with all our nutritional problems with all of our kids' uh, problems and actually gives great advice to helping to these kids to gain weight and do many other things. Um, she does pediatrics as well as a variety of other adult oncology special uh, special area, specialty areas. And then we have Karen Long Trainer. She's our psychologist. And um, Karen works with families, siblings, as well as the patients in addressing the psychological needs during treatment. So um, if the pharmacy uh, people would like to go, thank you very much. Sounds great. We are happy to kick it off and thank you for, um, thank you for having us. This is a great opportunity. We're happy to connect with our patients and their families. Um, so we, uh, the three of us are gonna, gonna kind of tag team this um, presentation and we're gonna highlight um, a number I think of, of what I hope you'll find to be helpful tips. Um, next slide. Um, so I will kind of be kicking this off by talking about some specific options and the best way for you to measure the, the medications that you need to give to your child. We'll talk about some techniques and ways to make medication administration successful. Um, and then Kathy and Liza are going to take over and talk about some really important medication safety concepts. So how to start to dispose of your medication, how to make sure that you're storing them safely, and making sure really that um, you're keeping your children safe from um, any harmful exposures to medications. Next slide. Um, so if only everything was this easy. So I've been a peds pharmacist here in New Brunswick for um, just about 20 years. And so when I started in peds, I was a pretty, you know, a young new graduate and very excited to be working with children. And the nurses from the floors would call me and say, you know, Jess, I, I need a new dose of this medication. The, you know, they they spit it out. Um, you know, oh, can you help me flavor this? The patient won't take it. And I kind of would always be confused. I'm like, well, you're bigger than them. What do you, what do you mean they won't take it? Just make them take it. Um, and then a few years later, I had my own kids and I felt like I should call every nurse I ever thought that to and apologize to them because boy, did I have my eyes opened once I had my own kids. Um, so that was definitely my, my lesson learned. Next slide. Uh, so we're going to go through first and talk about some of the options you have for how to give the medication to your kids. So first up, um, I really want to highlight that medication spoons, so your kitchen spoons, like your teaspoon, your tablespoons, are not safe for medication devices. They're not accurately um, calibrated to measure the right amount. So when we talk about a teaspoon in medication amount, we mean a specific volume when we count that as five mLs or five cc's. Um, and that is very specific. And not every kitchen teaspoon is going to measure that exact amount. So what we actually will recommend are a number of different options. Um, so just kind of, I thought this infographic was cute. So spoons are for soup and MLs are for your medication. Uh, so next slide. So oral syringes, I think, are one of the greatest um, inventions for delivering pediatric medication doses. They're available in a variety of sizes. Um, and you can ask at your pharmacy. I actually noticed in the past few years, they've been putting them in the bag when I get a liquid medication for my kids. Um, but if not, you can always ask if they have them available. Um, and we wanna use the smallest size or whatever's closest to the dose that you're giving. 
Um, and that just really helps make sure that we're giving an accurate amount. Uh, so if you have a dose that's a small amount, like a one ml dose, and you're trying to measure that in a larger size syringe, it's just gonna be more challenging for you to see the lines and to measure it accurately. So try and find a syringe size that's closest to what it is that you're gonna need. These are a great option for use in infants and for our younger children. Um, and you're looking to, to measure that dose uh, and place a syringe in the back pouch of the cheek um, and, and instill the dose a small amount at a time. When you're measuring the amount, you wanna make sure that you're clear on how much you're giving. So the, the dose in milliliters versus milligrams versus teaspoons might be different numbers. So this is something that's really important to make sure it's spelled out clearly in your prescription. And if you're confused by that or not sure, um, make sure to double check with the medical team or with your pharmacist. Um, be aware some of them may come with little plastic caps or tops on them, and those can be a choking hazard, especially in younger kids who you know are going to put anything in their mouth. Next slide. Um, so you can see here's just a number of different options. These orange caps on the left side are the ones I was mentioning um, that might be a risk for choking. Um, you can see here the, the couple parts of it, the barrel has the measurements on. So depending on what brand it is, it may be marked in mLs or maybe marked in teaspoons. Um, so again, just making sure that you're looking at the right number when you're measuring that. And then uh, when you're drawing up the dose, you're gonna pull back on the syringe. And I actually, I'm not at work right now. Mine are all buried in my bathroom. But when you're gonna pull back, um, you're gonna make sure there's no major large bubbles in there to accurately measure. And also you're going to measure to the top tip of the plunger. So you'll see kind of where um, the, the black part to on this orange one comes. You're gonna measure the drug to the top part of that. Next slide. Medicine droppers are another option. Um, these are things that you might see. They've come maybe with things like your polyvisol if you give if you gave the multivitamins to your, your children when they were infants. Um, and those also may have different markings on them as well. So this is another option, particularly for some of the smaller volumes that might be a good choice to use for smaller babies. For your kids that are a little bit older and are willing and cooperative, uh, cooperative um, you can use a measuring spoon or a medicine cup. Um, so you can see, again, these are specially calibrated to measure. Um, just kind of the caveat or to, the warning to remember, especially in kind of those plastic cups, you may see them, they come with some over-the-counter medications like your allergy medicine or some of the cough medicines, but those may not be good to measure very small doses. So you can see this one looks like it's measured in 2.5 and 5 ml increments. But if you had a very small amount, like a 1 ml, we couldn't use this cup to accurately measure that dose. Um, so, you know, again, recognizing there are options, but making sure that you're using the one that's the best choice for both the medication you're measuring as well as your child. Next slide. Um, if you're still using a bottle, we can also use a, a trick. And we've, I've learned this from my NICU nurses. Um, you can put the dose of the medication into the nipple with a small amount of liquid. Um, the warning here is you don't want to give put the medicine dose into the whole entire full bottle because if the baby doesn't finish the bottle, then you don't really have an idea of how much of the dose that they've taken. So you can never really guarantee they've taken it all. So you can put the medication dose, you know, with just a, a small amount of whether that's juice, breast milk formula, um, whatever is in there, let them finish that and then fill up the rest of the bottle with the remainder of their feeding. And that way you're sure that they get the whole dose. Okay, um, moving away from those, those ways to measure, we'll talk about some of the other options. So this is where, you know, this, this battle, I think is, is really what opened my eyes to what some of the nurses were experiencing when I had my own kids. So we have to realize that um, taking the medication is not the choice, but by giving your child some options, it makes them um, have a sense of power. So would you want to take this before breakfast or after breakfast? Do you want to take it with the measuring spoon or with the syringe? Um, do you want to take it in the bathroom after you brush your teeth or in the kitchen with breakfast? Do you want mommy to help you or do you want to take this on your own? Um, we'll talk about flavoring a little bit later. What flavor do you like? Um, and making sure that they understand the importance of why they need to take the medication. 
So in order to avoid um, that choking and that gagging reflex, um, giving the liquid medications in squalls, small squirts um, rather than shooting that whole entire syringe in there. And again, as I mentioned earlier, in kind of the lower cheek behind their tongue, not directly into the back of their throat. And then letting them swallow that, um, maybe giving them a sip of a drink in between before giving them any more. Um, I do recognize, and actually one of the educations that I do with all of our pediatric residents, um, we actually do a taste test day and I make them taste all of the disgusting medicine. So we, you know, my, my approach is, if you're gonna make and expect our patients to, to take this, I want you guys to understand how gross some of them are. Um, so some of your outpatient pharmacies, your, your CVS and your Walgreens chains may offer these flavoring services. Um, so this is something and I can actually recommend certain flavors will mask the, the bad taste of certain medications better. So these are definitely an option if you know you're, you try to get that regular bottle down into your, your patient into the kid and it's just not happening. Um, they can get creative with some of the flavoring and this might make it a little bit more palatable and, and better tasting. Um, we can also look at alternate dosing forms. So not all medications are available in liquids. We can also have some options that might be tablets, capsules, or chewable tabs. Um, trying even different brands. So especially your over-the-counter medications, um, there's, there's different flavors. You may find grape or ibuprofen, uh, grape or orange flavored ibuprofen, and, and your child may have a preference for one versus the other. Um, some of your capsules can be opened up and sprinkled on things like applesauce or pudding. Um, and this is a way, again, to avoid having to take a yucky tasting liquid and to kind of mask that um, the medicine inside another vehicle. Um, this is something that you're going to want to double check with your pharmacist, though, just to make sure that it's safe to open up the medication. Um, it's a good option for a lot of choices, but there are certain medications that shouldn't be opened or shouldn't be crushed up. And we always want to make sure we're doing that safely. So children as young as four can actually be taught to swallow tablets. Um, so this is something, and I've included some links here that I think are pretty helpful, um, but there's a number of resources out there on the internet, uh, but these are from some of the other children's hospitals that, that show some kind of step-by-step -step, um, things. But to highlight some of the choices, um, they talk about teaching proper head positions, so sitting up straight with the chin slightly up, um, and then practicing this, so doing short practice sessions, five, 10 minutes at a time, um, and using escalating, escalating size candies to practice. So starting with the tiny sprinkles, then going to a bigger sprinkles, then maybe like a mini M&M or a Tic Tac, um, and increasing, increasing until they get to a larger size candy. Um, the recommendations are to start with the smaller size ones and then stay at that size until the child masters it. So do the tiny sprinkles, for a day or two days, and once they've done that consistently, then go up to the medium-sized sprinkle and so forth. Um, so I think that's a great technique to try and learn how to swallow tablets. And this is something, again, as I mentioned, practicing to do it maybe at a, a little bit of a less stressful time. So not during, you know, not during the, the time when you're regularly giving them the medications, maybe during some downtime in the afternoon. Um, practicing and that'll get them up to speed and more comfortable with that process. Um, and parents can participate too. So as you show them how you swallow and model how you're gonna swallow the sprinkle or the candy, um, letting, the, letting your child copy off of you as well. And plus as an added treat, they get a piece of candy. Um, some other techniques we can use to get tablets into these kiddos. Um, you can put it into soft food and then swallow. So this is like I mentioned, applesauce, chocolate pudding, yogurt, ice cream, jello, again, all kind of treats. Um, but when it's within that vehicle, it makes it glide down the throat a little bit more easily. Um, having a moistened mouth and throat can make it also easier to swallow. And some kids find it easier to have water in their mouth first, then put the pill in and then swallow that together. Um, different beverages may also um, be easier, sometimes drinking um, a carbonated beverage or a thicker drink like a milkshake, the pill will stay mixed in with that liquid, um, so they won't really feel the pill going down their throat as much as they would feel it with, a, um, with like a water, um, with water drinking. And finally, a straw also is just a different technique to try um, and get that water coming into the mouth a little bit more forcefully, and then, um, you know, kind of tricking them into swallowing it all down at once. 
You can also trick the tongue. So you can use a frozen popsicle or give them an ice pop for a couple minutes before trying to give the medicine and that can numb the taste buds so that the taste isn't so apparent. Uh, we can try some tricks to disguise the taste, chocolate syrup, um, pancake syrup, cherry syrup. So something that has a, a more pleasant flavor, sweetened to try and kind of cover up the taste of the medication. And again, kind of similar to what I mentioned with the baby bottle, mixing um, with just a small amount of that food or liquid. So you're not trying to make them eat, you know, a giant tub of pudding with the medicine all mixed around in there. So putting it in just a spoon or two and then letting them finish the rest of the food afterwards. Um, overall, um, you know, children can sense when their moms and dads are stressed. So allowing enough time that your child isn't pressured or rushed, you know, it's very hard when you have, you know, X number of minutes to get out the door to school and trying to, you know, to battle with these medications in the morning before school. So maybe it's better to do in the evening when you have a little bit more time and less, you know, less of a time crunch to get out the door. Using kind of a positive reinforcement or reward system, so something like a sticker chart or candies for, um, you know, for successful completion of this, giving lots of encouragement and praise with the medication. Um, and then if you do happen to be admitted, there's resources for support as well in the hospital. So our nurses and our child life specialists are really experts and, and can help um, provide some support and advice during admission. So you can pick up on tips and tricks from them what they find to be successful with your child and learn from those techniques to take home. Okay, okay. And I'm gonna hand off to my partners now. Okay, so yeah, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Liza and I are gonna to talk to you guys about medication safety. Overall, medications are gonna be a very important part of your child's care. And while they do have many benefits, it's important to realize that they do have risks as well. So we do have to be careful, not only when we're giving it, but also how we store it and how we dispose of it. Um, talking about med safety, uh, in the pediatric population, we really think about accidental ingestions, um, and this actually happens may, way more often than you might think. Um, just in a year, there are about 62,000 ED visits due to this, about 450,000 calls to the Poison Control Center, and more than 60% of these are kids between, between one and two years old. Um, so why are these kids more at risk for an accidental ingestion? Well, of course, kids don't understand that medications are dangerous. And then some of the strategies that we may use to make them take it actually could lead them to them taking too much if they're trying to emulate it or do it again when you're not around. And as we all know, toddlers and little kids, they're very uh, curious and they explore their environment and they, they get anything they get their hands on, they'll put right in their mouth and they'll swallow it. And so with medication, we have to be very careful because there are some um, medications that just a few tablets can be very harmful to a child that's not supposed to be taking them. Um, next slide. Um, so medications are dangerous, as I said, and this is especially true if you're not taking them appropriately. So if they're not the medications prescribed to you, um, if you take too much or too little of it, or again, the same accidental ingestion, there are certain medications that we consider hazardous and a lot of chemotherapy fall into this class. These are ones that an exposure to them, not necessarily an in ingestion, but just an exposure in general can have negative effects, especially if you don't have cancer. So if you're the caregiver, um, exposure can have effects on you. So we're gonna talk a little bit later on how to uh, minimize that for yourself to keep you safe. Because in the end, that is the goal, to keep everybody safe and to make sure your child gets the right meds the right way so they'll be the most effective. An important way to help prevent um, any accidental ingestions for young kids who are in the house is medication storage. So in general, as you know, many have said before, um, kids are very exploratory. So they will reach and grab whatever they're interested in. So try to keep medications out of reach of children. Don't keep them on a low shelf and, um, and keep them in a safe space. Something that we'd like to remind family members and uh, of children who are getting medications is that in your house, it's not just your medications. If you have family coming over like a grandparent who um, is bringing medications with them, Remind them as well to keep their own medications in a safe place because that can be an easy oversight of extra meds in the house that a kid could accidentally reach. Um, in general, besides just keeping meds in a safe space so the kids can't reach them, it's also important for your kid to keep the medication in a place where it won't um, change the effect of the medication or degrade it. 
So we always say don't keep medications in hot and humid areas. So that's bathrooms or st near stoves in the kitchen or leaving them in your car. A car can get very hot. So overall, where would you want to store medications? Um, if you can click forward a few more um, on the slide. Um, so we want to keep them out of reach of kids, keep them in a higher cabinet, maybe keep them in your room since that's away from the bathroom in the kitchen. Um, keep them in a cool and dry environment in general. If they have to be put in a refrigerator, try to put them on the top shelf um, so that it's out, out of reach of the child. And um, in general, uh, kids do emulate adults. So if they see you taking a medication, it might help them understand how to open that medication. So uh, also taking medications out of sight of children could help as well. All medications are dispensed from pharmacies with childproof caps. And some of them have the ability to become inversed so that it is easier to remove. So if you do have young kids in the house, we always recommend to keep it on the childproof setting, but not all childproof caps are 100%. So a kid can always still learn how to do it. Um, so it's always important to still keep them in a safe, um, higher location. Next slide. What's really nice is that um, the DEA actually has a way to dispose of medications for families. It's a great way to help prevent unnecessary or unwanted medication um, exposures to kids is by cleaning out your medication closet. So if you have a lot of um, older medications that you just wanted to dispose but haven't had a chance to do it, the DEA has a take back day two times a year um, where you can go and drop off medications you no longer need. The next one's actually very soon. It's uh, next week on April 22nd. And I, I put a picture here, but you can find this on the DEA website of a bunch of sites that are gonna be open on this day in the New Brunswick area. So you can log on there and try to find um, a site that's near you putting in your zip code. Um, and they sometimes have the ability to find drop off locations if you miss April 22nd as well. So definitely take advantage of this as a way to clean out old unnecessary medications and help reduce the risk of um, and accidental exposure. Next slide. Okay, so if you miss the takeout day or take back day or you um, it's too far away, there are ways you can dispose of meds on your own. Uh, it actually depends on the type of medication. So for most pills and tablets and capsules, um, you actually can dispose them in your normal garbage. But again, we're trying to keep everybody safe, including our pets. So we don't want anything that a dog could get to in the garbage. So it's actually recommended to mix it in something um, that's not really pal palatable. So maybe dirt or coffee grinds or even cat litter, um, put that in a bag and then you can throw it in the garbage. There are certain medications that are recommended to flush down the toilet. Um, this is more for drug diversion. So medications that we wouldn't want people to get their hands on. Um, so opioids and narcotics and pain meds. And then the last uh, different group is sharps. This are meds that include needles or glass vials. Um, the first picture is a picture of a sharps container. Um, some companies, if they're sending you the injection, will actually send you a little sharps container. If not, it's really just a thick plastic container. Um, so something that you might have at home, um, such as a laundry detergent bottle, is actually very good for that. So you would just put all the sharp needles into the bottle, and then you could then dispose of it in the garbage, or you could even bring it to Robert Wood, and we could dispose of it there. Um, the next slide is just um, something that the FDA has on the website. This is where you can find that flush list. So if you're curious which meds go in, down the toilet and which go in the trash, it's on the FDA website. You can even just Google FDA flush list and you'll find this. Um, and then next slide is just, again, from the FDA website, um, more instructions on how to dispose of them. They actually recommend also scratching out uh, your personal information just to prevent anyone from stealing your identity are using that information in ways you don't want them to. So again, you mix it into something um, inert such as um, coffee grinds, place it in a bag and seal it and then throw it in the garbage. Okay, so yeah, medication safety in general, it's a passionate topic for all pharmacists. And um, accidental exposure isn't the only way that a patient could potentially have uh, harm from a medication. We have something called medication errors, where a medication that's been properly prescribed to somebody is just taken in the incorrect way. And there are definite ways to prevent that from happening. We always say, check the label first. Um, make sure it's for the right person, it's the right medication, it's the right dose, and it's being given at the right time. Um, and 
the right patient is in this case in scenario is if you happen to have multiple children, you want to make sure you're giving it to the right child. And you want to make sure that the medication you've chosen is the right one you want to give for that time of day. Always follow the medication labels instructions. And if you are thinking about trying to divert from those instructions or stop a medication, don't do so until you've confirmed with a doctor for sure. In terms of trying to prevent other basic errors, you should always make sure the dose is correct. So if it is a liquid medication, um, as we discussed before, figure out what units it's in and always make sure the amount of MLs you're giving is the correct one. If it's tablets, you might be giving one or two tablets with each dose. So make sure you know that for sure. And in terms of what time, it's not just the time of day. It could be you need it in the morning or the evening, but also does it need to be given with food? And also if it is it the right day of the week? We have a couple of medications that our patients in the clinic take, such as an, anti uh, an antibiotic called Bactrim that we only give on Saturdays and Sundays. So that's just an example of how the schedule might be a little bit more confusing. So it's important to follow exactly the instructions. Another thing we like to remind um, family members and caregivers is in general, decide in advance who's giving each medication. It can be really easy to double up on doses or miss a dose if there's multiple caregivers involved. So try to have a system. So that way you don't both give a medication at the same time or within an hour of each other. Um, this example here is mom gives all the morning meds and dad gives all the evening meds. Next slide. And we're not superhuman, no one is. So never rely on your memory. Uh, it's important to follow the instructions on the bottle. And if anything on that bottle is confusing, ask your doctor for more specific information exactly on how to give it. Have it out in writing for you so it's more clear. And definitely keep a log or a calendar of what medications you're giving and when you gave them. It's nice because if you do have a calendar or a log of some sort, you can check off once you've given um, that medication in the morning and you'll know for sure it was given. This is really great, especially if you ever go off schedule because a lot of us have typical schedules during the day. Um, and if you go on vacation, for example, you might be a little bit off of your normal routine. So having a calendar or a log can really reassure you that you know you've given medications, even if you've given them a little earlier than you've planned, for example. It's important to always remember that you have a lot of resources besides asking um, your clinicians for more specifics or asking for help from them to make charts. There's also many apps and websites and lots of technology nowadays that can help remind you with how to give medications. Some people will just do something as simple as an alarm on their phone, but Others, you can use apps and websites like My Med Schedule to create nice charts for you to follow and log your administrations of medications, or just to have them prompt you with alerts um, through the phone. Next slide. These are just a couple snippets um, from My Med Schedule specifically. This one has a website and an app. And when you go online onto the website, you can actually build charts for yourself um, and print them out. Um, or you can use the app as a loan on your phone to help prompt you on when to give medications, what the medication looks like. So it can be a nice cross check for you when you're trying to organize your patient's, uh, your child's meds. Especially for um, kids with complex diseases, they can be on a lot of medications. So using something like this can definitely help. This is just another example from safemedication.com of what a chart might look like if you did want to use one that split up the chart by morning, afternoon, and uh, bedtime, for example. Okay, so now getting a little bit more into administering meds, this is mostly for those hazardous meds that we were talking about before. So again, a lot of the chemotherapy. Um, so when dealing with these, again, um, exposure to yourself can cause some negative effects. So you just want to make sure that you wear gloves anytime you're handling the medications. And then if you have to crush the tablet, crushing it actually can put a little bit into the air and you could breathe it in. Um, so it's recommended that you wear not only gloves, but also a mask if you're doing that. And one little trick you could do is put it in a plastic bag and then crush it. So not only are you preventing it from getting into the air, but you'll know that you'll have the entire dose to give to your child. Another thing to uh, pay attention to is if you have any tools or utensils used for crushing or mixing meds, make sure they're um, specifically for that hazardous med. So for that bag that you just crushed the med in, don't store something else in it. Or if you use a knife to cut a med, don't then go and cut your food with that. Because um, again, we want to keep you safe so that you can take care of your child and keep them safe. Um, so next slide. Um, so here is just a little bit about herbals and supplements. Um, so 
when we think about med safety, we're not only talking about meds that are prescribed, we're also talking about over the counters and then herbals and supplements. Um, so it's important to remember that the FDA doesn't actually regulate herbals and supplements. So there's no um, evaluation of safety or efficacy that's being done. So you can't be sure that what is stated on the label that it will treat this disease is actually true. Um, there's actually not even a full insurance that the ingredients listed and the doses are what's actually in them. Um, so you just wanna be very careful when choosing herbals and supplements. And in addition to that, even if it is the right drug and dose, um, actually herbals have a lot of uh, drug interactions and they could interact with the medication that your patients, your child's already taking. Um, so an interaction is when one drug affects how another one works. So it could increase the dose or decrease the dose and you wouldn't even realize. Um, there's actually almost 1,500 documented interactions between drugs and herbals and dietary supplements. So this is a very important thing to think about. We're not saying you have to completely avoid them, but really just make sure you let your doctors and your pharmacists know so they can look into it and determine if there is an interaction or if it is safe for the, your child to take these. And lastly, just to wrap it up, um, when in doubt, ask for help. There are many people that are part of our team here at CINJ and, and abroad that are here to help. Ask any health professional, a doctor, a nurse, your local pharmacy, um, because we're here to help explain things and make things clear. And if you guys have questions, you're more than welcome to ask. And we wanna make sure that you feel confident and secure in how you're administering medications for your child. I also have, here is the Poison Control Center phone number. Every person and family should know this number and have access to it. What's amazing about the Poison Control Center is it's a 24 seven service um, where anybody can call at any time if they have a concern for what somebody might have ingested. So they can help give you advice on how to monitor if you saw your kid take um, a medication that they weren't supposed to take. They can give you advice on if you should go to the emergency department or not. And even for things that aren't medications, if your kids swallowed a coin, you can call them and they can tell you whether or not you need to take next steps to observe if that had happened. So take advantage of that resource, definitely. Next slide. Uh, yeah, and so overall, over the entire presentation, you know, it's difficult to give uh, kids medications. Not only it's difficult to give yourself medication sometimes and stay on top of your own medication schedule, but also to give it to your children can be, can be difficult. So try and stay up, try many different tactics, work with your healthcare professionals to figure out the best way to give medications to your children so that you can be successful and feel successful that you're providing that care for your child. Um, and always take the medication as prescribed and talk to doctors um, if you have any questions um, regarding them. And Ask for help if you ever need any regarding clarifying how to give something, how to dispose of something, and try your best to practice safe medication practices. So that way you can try to prevent any medication errors if possible. Um, but us from pharmacy always say, you can always reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Liza and Jess, a very informative uh, presentation and a lot of good techniques that we try to use in the hospital. Like you said, it's a stressful event at that time and it doesn't always work then, but very good um, advice. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Lori Magoulis. She is our dietitian, registered dietitian, and she's going to talk about taking one bite at a time, feeding your child during treatment for cancer or blood disorders. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so, um, I'm going to be talking about the nutrition part. So I'm going to start out with uh, diet and cancer and then uh, move on to blood disorders. So we know that adequate and appropriate nutrition is really important for the health and the growth and de development of children, including those with cancer. We also know that cancer, cancer interrupts growth through a variety of metabolic as well as treatment related effects. And cancer treatment can interfere with the ability to eat well and disrupt established eating habits and food preferences. Um, children are more susceptible to malnutrition uh, because of their rapid growth. They have smaller reserves and their needs are increased per increment of weight. 
Um, they're also susceptible to protein depletion. Next slide. So there can be existing uh, inappropriate or inadequate nutrition that results in a child being underweight, being overweight, or nutrient depleted. And this can occur in children before their cancer diagnosis, at their diagnosis, or even during and after treatment. So nutrition is an important part of supportive care in pediatric cancer. Next slide. So nutrition support is important because malnutrition and improper nutrition can influence not only treatment outcomes, but also their development and growth. So things that can be affected are tolerance to treatment, treatment response, susceptibility to infection, quality of life, and overall survival. So really proactive nutrition intervention is important and an important goal to prevent malnutrition, to minimize weight loss or minimize excess weight gain, to support growth, lessen fatigue and decrease infection risk. Next slide. So treatment can impact feeding behaviors, digestion and utilization of food. A majority of childhood cancers are treated with combined therapy, commonly creating side effects, which can lead to poor nutrition and nutritional deprivation. So treatment may include chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery. And we know that chemo and radiation are damaging rapidly growing cells, including those in the mouth and the GI tract. So this can have an effect on nutrient absorption, cause fluid losses, electrolyte imbalances, deficiency of protein and other nutrients. Also can create symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which affect food intake. Uh, some treatments include periods of intensive uh, treatment and that can also enhance or contribute to the severity of some of the side effects. Steroids can also be a part of treatment or they can be prescribed to help with some of the side effects. And they have a bunch of side effects on their own, which can include increased appetite, uh, excess weight gain, difficulty sleeping, upset stomach, um, changes in blood pressure, as well as blood sugar. Next slide. So what might nutrition intervention look like? Well, it could be as simple as nutrition counseling. So uh, I might be called in to um, maybe uh, provide some dietary tweaking, especially if a child is nourished, they're not losing weight, but they're just not eating very well. Um, I might be called in for uh, counseling for patients who might be overweight or obese at diagnosis. Um, and also if those patients may be on uh, long-term use of steroids. Um, nutrition intervention could also be oral supplements. So those might be indicated if a child is still struggling with their ability to eat enough, at least 50% of their intake, they're having weight loss, um, and it could include nutrition shakes, other modulars like protein powders, um, specific oils, um, and other types of carbohydrate powders that can be added to food. And then sometimes enteral nutrition or a feeding tube might be necessary. And that's really um, evaluated if a child still isn't able to eat um, and they're really sort of, it's going on for at least five days in a row, probably three days if the child is under one. Um, if they are malnourished, like if, they're, if their growth parameters and their weight are in the low part of the range, and if they're experiencing a significant weight loss since their diagnosis. Now, cancer survivorship is also a place where nutrition intervention may be important um, because there are changes in eating habits, uh, food preferences that may occur, but also cancer survivors, pediatric cancer survivors can be at increased risk for uh, certain metabolic disorders as well. Next slide. So part of the assessment that I might do would be definitely looking at diet history. Um, how much protein, carbohydrate, and fat is a child taking in? Are there any food aversions? Are there any food allergies or intolerances that are present or they're starting to experience? 
what their eating patterns might look like, their meal timing, their portion sizes, as well as looking at height and weight at the start of treatment, how weight trends may uh, change during treatment, and then lab data, as well as activity to sort of look at uh, in order to um, make decisions on um, dietary changes. Next slide. So symptom management is really an important part of um, the nutrition aspect during treatment. And I know the title sort of had this holistic um, part to it. And I see holistic in the setting of nutrition really implying food-based guidance and maybe ways to manipulate diet to help with symptom management. Um, you know, when uh, this, as this presentation is going forward, you could think of sort of healthy whole foods as close to their natural state um, to kind of be including in your child's diet. However, sometimes the best intentions some of the uh, healthy diet uh, parameters might not be possible. And we end up bending the rules um, really just to accomplish just getting something eaten. So um, food aversions and cravings can come into play and it can make it kind of challenging uh, to feed your child. So with regard to symptom management, it's really a lot of the GI symptoms um, that are coming into play. Um, and those symptoms that come in that can negatively impact nutrition include changes in appetite, feeling full sooner, smaller portion sizes, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, um, dry mouth or sores in the mouth, um, as well as taste changes. Next slide. So I'm gonna spend a little time on these next couple of slides going over maybe some things that you can do within each one of these um, uh, side effects. So when appetite isn't so great, it can really be hard to nourish your child. And usually we recommend just not waiting for the child to kind of ask for food, but really trying to kind of put them on a timing schedule if you can, and maybe offering them food every couple of hours so that they're eating smaller portions and meals over the day instead of large meals, which may seem uh, difficult to accomplish. High calorie, high protein foods can be really uh, handy to keep in the house. Those would include things like nuts, nut butters, hummus, hard boiled eggs, cheese, full fat yogurt, ice cream. Um, you can encourage your child to eat more on those days or times during the day that they're feeling better. Um, trying to have them relax during meals and uh, maybe even encouraging some movement and light activity, which could help increase appetite. Sometimes supplements can be useful to use in between meals that are high in calorie and protein. I listed a few here. Or you could make your own um, smoothies with uh, whole milk, fruits, and other ingredients that your child likes. Um, and then also explaining to your child, if appropriate, that you know food can be just as important as their medicine. Next slide. With regard to early satiety, this is sort of getting full after just a couple of bites. Same thing, offering maybe small frequent meals, letting the child graze over the day. Um, if they're just taking bites of foods, then maybe having them do that every hour. Um, again, eating when they're maybe having uh, a higher hunger um, and then having those calorie dense and high protein foods available. Um, another good important tip is having them drink their liquids in between meals instead of with their meals so they're not they're filling overfilling their stomach. Avoiding carbonated foods and things that are gassy. Um, and then maybe going low fiber for a little while um, so that uh, the food's getting digested a little bit more quickly. Um, eating in a calm and pleasant place and then also um, activity can help sort of move things along in the GI and maybe increase appetite. Next slide. So for nausea and queasy feeling, definitely dry and bland is a great rule to follow. Um, also sipping on water as well as other calorie containing liquids throughout the day can be a way to sort of at least get some calories in. 
thinking about, especially if the child's vomiting, maybe things that are easy to digest. So crackers, jello, plain toast. Um, and then thinking about whether there might be uh, aroma that could be creating some of the nausea as well and maybe limit, lim limiting um, aromas. Cool and light foods free of strong smells might be um, also very useful. Um, from a holistic perspective also, um, I have some parents that may have used ginger or chamomile tea to help settle stomach. Another one is gripe water, uh, which I have a recipe for if you're interested, um, that can also be helpful. And then taking the um, supportive anti-nausea medications as prescribed can also be helpful as well, um, instead of waiting for those symptoms to occur if you know that there's a pattern of them. Next slide. So relating to diarrhea, one of the most important things is to prevent dehydration. So um, definitely making sure adequate, generous amounts of fluids are coming through the day. And if you're using fluids that have calories in them, it's another way to sort of sneak in at least some calories. And things like Pedialyte also have some electrolytes that can be um, useful for replacement of losses. And also, maybe limiting dairy products as well. Next slide. So regarding constipation, you could uh, tweak the diet to bring in more fiber. And most of the fiber in our diet comes from our fruit and vegetable intake, as well as making choices for higher fiber starches like breads and cereals, and then other plant-based starches that already have built-in fiber. Um, definitely increasing fluid intake can be useful. And then utilizing things like prune, pear juice uh, can also be helpful as well. Exercise is another thing that can promote um, GI motility. Next slide. So if mouth sores are present, um, definitely avoiding acidic and spicy and very strongly flavored um, foods that might uh, cause more irritation. Looking for soft and bland foods that are easy to chew, um, that are not rough on the inside of the mouth. Uh, making milkshakes, puddings, cottage cheese, mashed potatoes uh, come to mind as soft choices. Um, maybe cooking vegetables until they're really soft so that they're easy to chew and less irritating. And adding broths, gravies, and maybe mild sauces to make things more moist so that they're not only easier to chew, but easier to swallow as well. Often foods cold or at room temperature are a little bit more comfortable to be consuming. And um, smoothies can be a really good uh, meal replacement uh, with fruit, protein powders, and they also uh, are usually served cool. Next slide. So with regards to taste changes, I find that it can be really helpful to, if your child's old enough, try to have a discussion about what it is um, if a food is um, avoided. And sometimes taste changes could uh, include foods that are sweet that just taste really even more enhanced sweet, or they can have an off flavor, maybe bitter or metallic, or there isn't really any flavor that they're able to perceive. So depending on what the issue might be can help you decide what you might be able to do to that food or additional foods to offer. So if foods don't really have much taste, um, you could uh, add extra seasonings to it, um, as well as uh, vinegar. If things are tasting off, sometimes the fruity and salty flavors are better accepted. Um, when things are tasting metallic, we usually recommend avoiding uh, metal utensils, instead using plastic. And if things are a little bit bitter, Maybe adding fruit-based marinades or marmalades or things like that to foods can sort of offset those flavors. Next slide. So sometimes um, smells can be uh, a little bit overpowering um, and there can be some quick and easy things you can do such as avoiding um, 
cooking, like having your child not around when cooking is happening, um, considering grilling outside if the weather permits, maybe preparing and cooking foods at an earlier time and putting them in the refrigerator so that they just have to be heat up and they'll put out less aroma into the house. Um, some foods that aren't cooked, such as smoothies, cold sandwiches, crackers, those types of things don't have as much of an aroma. Um, avoid using the microwave if it's an issue because they do spread food odors a lot more efficiently. And then um, using cups with uh, lids or straws can also help mask food odors as well. Next slide. So um, if steroids are used, um, they can have their own side effects, um, which could be related to excess weight gain. Um, appetite can be increased, which can trigger increased intake as well as some food cravings. So we usually recommend trying to avoid really high sodium foods, um, trying to avoid uh, sugar sweetened beverages and high sugar foods as well. Um, sometimes steroids can raise blood sugar levels and you know increased sweet consumption can just uh, contribute to that. Um, also, when appetite sort of is very large or feels like it's out of control, trying to put together balanced meals that have a good portion of fruit and vegetables on them, as well as high fiber can kind of give those meals more staying power so the kids can feel full for longer. Next slide. So next I wanna talk a little bit about nutrition and um, blood disorders. So good nutrition is also important for children um, with blood disorders because um, appetite intake and growth can also be impacted by disease course of these blood disorders, as well as uh, you know, side effects of treatment. Next slide. So sickle cell disease um, is also called sickle cell anemia. It's inherited, it's a genetic red blood cell disorder. And what happens is individuals um, may experience episodes of pain, fatigue, and infections. Um, they can also uh, have deficits in weight um, as well as uh, delayed skeletal maturation. Um, some of the complications associated with the disease can be due in part to nutritional deficiencies. We know that kids with sickle cell disease compared to their peers, um, they can have a decreased height and weight. Um, and it's also common to see decreased levels of several vitamins and minerals. So these types of things can just contribute to some of the complications um, and the nutritional deficits. Next slide. So patients with sickle cell disease also have increased needs. So they have an increased protein need um, as well as calorie and vitamins. And this is said to be due related to, uh, they have a higher protein metabolism, higher cell turnover, and also at the same time, their appetite can be depressed as uh, suppressed as well as um, they have a higher energy expenditure. So, Increased needs, decreased intake can put these children at risk of being nutritionally deficient. Often their dietary intake can be poor of calcium, vitamin D. Um, they may have low levels of vitamin A, some of the B vitamins. And um, also during sickle cell crises, um, and if they have frequent bouts of illnesses and hospitalization, that can also compound um, a poor intake as well. Next slide. So thalassemia is another blood disorder um, in which the body has flu fewer red blood cells, less hemoglobin. Um, it is inherited and present at birth. Um, there can be uh, two uh, globin chains that can be affected. Um, and really, uh, they're having trouble carrying enough oxygen in their blood. Next slide. So depending on if they're having a mild form or a moderate to severe form, um, treatment may be indicated. So typically in moderate and severe thalassemia, uh, treatment is um, 
indicated with uh, blood transfusions and regular transfusions um, can increase quality of life and length of life, but also can cause a side effect where um, iron deposits can uh, develop in tissues and um, they can have a, a iron overload. Next slide. So they can also experience uh, inadequate growth, poor immune function, um, as well as uh, changes in bone mineralization. Um, there can be uh, inadequate intake. They may not be eating enough. They could have elevated loss. And there may be increased requirements for certain nutrients. So research supports that um, they can definitely benefit by a well-balanced diet that's rich in antioxidants especially zinc, magnesium, calcium, vitamin D, and folate. So the goal would be to increase daily intake of these. And we know that optimizing nutritional intake can improve uh, health in children with thalassemia. Next slide. So diamond black fan anemia is also another uh, blood disorder. It, it's inherited uh, as well. And it's a failure of the bone marrow to make red blood cells, and patients can become severely anemic. So the anemia isn't due to a deficiency in iron or other vitamins. Um, and um, there are some dietary adjustments for uh, diamond black fan anemia as well. Next slide. So with this um, disease, blood transfusion as well as steroid use um, are often part of medical treatment. Next slide. So with going over what the nutrition guidelines would be, um, I think it's also important to think about what the best type of diet may be. And um, I think with sickle cell and thalassemia, definitely focusing on getting calories in and making sure that they're coming in throughout the day. So using nutrient-dense foods, trying to avoid uh, empty calorie foods, um, offering healthy fats can be a useful way to boost up calories, and um, also making sure that fluid intake is... Um, at the appropriate level to prevent dehydration, constipation, and also pain crisis episodes. Next slide. So what type of diet is best? Really one that's diverse. So it's rich in daily intake of calcium rich foods, dairy is the best source, getting in fruits and vegetables each day for the nutrients, the fiber and other minerals and making sure that protein is getting included at least a couple times a day, including healthy fat, especially um, when weight gain is uh, needed. And all of these things can help optimize nutrient levels and growth potential. Um, next slide. So I put this slide up to just provide uh, sources of folic acid. We know that it is a B vitamin that's important in uh, cell growth and DNA formation. It can help with anemia. Adequate folic acid is important. So good sources are included here, which include dried beans, lentils, peas, avocado. Um, I have a list if anyone needs it. Next slide. development, um, for building and ma maintaining strong bones, making sure both calcium and vitamin D foods are coming in. Um, dairy, as I said, is a very rich source of calcium, but we also have calcium fortified juices, uh, tofu, even salmon, and some of the green leafies. Um, there's also lactose-free products, um, dairy alternatives, if uh, there is lactose intolerance. Vitamin D um, is important. Fortified milk is a good source, yogurt and eggs. We also can make vitamin D in the sun. Um, and 15 minutes in the sun without any sunscreen can give you uh, a nice dose of vitamin D. Next slide. 
So we talked a little bit about fiber to prevent constipation. Remember, half of it is coming from our fruit and vegetable intake, and the other is coming from the type of grains and starches that we consume, as well as beans and lentils. Empty calories can fill children up without providing a lot of nutrients. So things that would be in that category would be soda, sugar-sweetened beverages, sports drinks, which tend to be high in added sugar. And if necessary, um, avoiding obesity, which can occur, um, especially with uh, ster long-term steroid use. And sometimes children with sickle cell disease, they might not be as active um, as their peers. So, you know, looking at uh, a healthier diet can sort of prevent obesity. And then trying to uh, promote movement and physical activity and outdoor play when possible. Next slide. So this slide just sort of talks about uh, good sources of zinc, which include most meats, um, as well as some other plant sources. Next slide. There is some data looking at omega-3, um, important for helping uh, red blood cell membranes, making them less fragile and less likely to sickle. So um, fatty fish can be a good source, as well as um, some of the nuts and seeds and olive oil. And some foods are fortified with them as well. Next slide. So with regards to iron, um, if patients uh, are having um, transfusions and they're um, having some iron overload, um, there are things that you can do to manipulate diet that can sort of uh, decrease dietary iron, but also sort of interfere with the body's absorption of iron. Um, some children may need to follow a low iron diet, um, which helps minimize the amount of iron that's available. To the, uh, to the body. Next slide. So foods that are high in vitamin C can increase iron absorption. So you could avoid having fruits, vegetables, high vitamin C foods with uh, iron rich foods. Um, tea, the tannins in tea can interfere with iron absorption. So you can drink tea when you're having some iron rich foods. And also calcium interferes, they compete for absorption. So you can include dairy or uh, calcium rich foods at a meal where you might be having uh, a high iron food. Next slide. So you can look at food labels to get an idea of those foods that uh, are high in iron. Typically, if you're looking at the label, what would be considered a uh, high iron would be if it's giving you more than 20% of the daily value, uh, it's considered a high source. If you're taking a multivitamin, your child's taking a multivitamin to choose one without iron might be appropriate. Next slide. So one last thing as far as a takeaway, I think is, you know, parents often get just concerned uh, during cancer treatment that a child's good eating habits just totally go out the window and they're craving junk food. If those are some of the things that they are going to include in their diet because they're limited on what they're willing to eat, just remember that after treatment is completed, uh, I'm available, nutrition is available in order to kind of undo some of those maybe less than healthy habits that occur during treatment. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lori. That was an excellent presentation. I actually learned several new things tonight. Uh, next, I'd like to, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Karen Long Trainer. Um, she is our psychologist who sees our patients, inpatient and outpatient, as well as siblings and parents. Um, go ahead, Karen. I was still muted. Hello, everybody. Go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about just how to help your child emotionally cope with issues, the side effects of treatment, the emotional side effects, as well as the physical side effects. But I want to take a moment to talk about you as a parent and that you are really put in a very difficult and impossible situation that when you were, um, when your child was young, 
um, if they, you don't imagine, you, you think about the things that you're going to have to deal with, whether it's social issues or um, a terrible twos or teenager dealing, talking back to you, you don't necessarily think that, oh my God, my kid is going to have cancer and what, how am I going to deal with that? Or in terms of sickle cell, you may or may not be prepared for that. And as throughout the trajectory of the sickle cell disease, there, there may be a time when it becomes more intense during adolescence or a little bit um, later. And it, it just really is a lot for parents. I just want to give that shout out to you guys. Next slide. Um, there are, I'm preaching to the choir here, but when there is a new diagnosis or when there is an exacerbation of diagnosis, there are a, a lot of physical side effects that go along with it that parents need to learn how to cope with and the kids need to learn how to cope with. Next slide. And along with that, there are emotional and behavioral side effects. Some of these are related to dealing with either a chronic illness and being different from their friends, having to um, just deal with the realities of something like sickle cell, or it can be the, the side effect of having a new cancer diagnosis, being in the hospital for the first time, being a um, completely new environment and not knowing what to expect. There can also be some side effects from the medications that can cause, can chemically alter mood and change, change the way that a kid is coping. Some of the, the common things that happen across disease are difficulty with pill swallowing, neophobias, eating issues, and then the gen general anger, Ill irritability, depression, all of that. I wanna say something about specifically about pill swallowing, eating and needles that so it's not just that they are unpleasant. There is a primitive biological part of ourself that is um, designed to keep us alive, that having to take pills that make us feel sick, having to eat food when maybe we don't feel good or we're nauseous, having to pierce our skin goes against our base instinct of what we're supposed to do to survive. So some of our kids are are naturally reacting to that. And I think we have to recognize that it's not just kids being dramatic or argumentative or trying to be manipulative. This is very much part of how we're designed as human beings. That nausea is a, a warning system in our body that we've put something bad in it and we have to either throw it up or it's a reminder when we see that bad thing, that nausea is a reminder to stay away from it. So when you put a, a pill in your body that doesn't make you feel very good, it's natural that over time, there can be a, a little bit of an aversion to it. It doesn't mean that we can't still address that. Next slide. So back to you parents for just a second. Um, that parenting a child with a new diagnosis or parenting a child with a, a chronic illness is not easy. Parenting in general is tough. You add in this extra complication and the, the stress levels really intensify. We don't innately know how to parent kids. We learn it from the people around us. Um, so we don't innately know how to parent a child with cancer or chronic illness. When we don't have those examples around us, we're, we're really at a loss. Um, trying to figure that out can be incredibly stressful, especially if you're in a hospital setting. Um, I like to think of it as parenting in a fishbowl. You're trying to figure out how you are supposed to react to this kid that is now being much more argumentative than they ever were before, maybe crying, distressed, refusing medication. Um, you have to figure out this new way to interact with a whole lot of eyes on you. And I can tell you that our, our staff are incredibly supportive and understanding and recognize what is normal behavior, but it is completely natural as a parent to worry about whether you're doing it right or to feel judged. And um, it, it just adds to the stress that I want to acknowledge. Okay, next slide. One of the things that is completely unfair is that while you parents are trying to figure out how to help your kids, how you react is going to make a really big difference in how they react. They're looking to you for the 
the model to show them how they're supposed to do it. You can be reactive to a situation, just take it as it comes, um, perhaps show a lot of stress and anxiety. You might cry, you can be overreactive to situations, underreactive to situations, or you can take a proactive stance and really accept the realities of, of cancer or sickle cell and make a plan about how you're going to deal with that. I want to point out that when I say reacting with anxiety or crying or depression, it's, it's actually, it's not a bad thing to show those to your kids. It's um, in fact, not showing them and putting on an overly positive attitude can, can be really counterproductive. What is important though, is acknowledging the fear, the sadness, the anger, while also demonstrating that you can handle that and not being completely overwhelmed and taken over by it. So you're modeling a, a healthy way to hold on to those feelings and to cope with them. Okay, next place, next page. So in order to, to really address these issues, it is important to recognize what are typical reactions to medications and treatment in the hospital. So for example, um, tantrums during steroid use are very common. Uh, resistance to taking medication. Uh, older kids might minimize the importance of um, adhering to their, their medical plan. There may be an increase in talking back, all of those things. All of those things are really common reactions. And while you are, wait, sorry, it wasn't quite done. And while you're recognizing this, it's important to be kind to yourself as a parent. And what I mean by that isn't that you need to, um, I'm not talking about the whole self-care thing. What I mean is parents are naturally judgmental of themselves. Um, they are wondering if they're doing it right. They think everybody else has a better sense of how to parent than they do. I have that same feeling sometimes. And it's important to recognize that you are doing a good job and you're doing the best that you can and give yourself a little bit of a break. When these kind of behaviors come up, you don't have to figure out how to do it all by yourself. Again, parenting is not a um, innate instinct. We learn how to do that from our environment, from people around us. And so you have a huge team of people here to support you. Um, inpatient, there's child life and art therapy. Inpatient and outpatient, there's nutrition, psychology, psychiatry, I'm gonna put it on here, but nurses, physicians, all of us can help you get through this. Okay. Next page. So now getting into the bit about how you actually do change behavior. Um, research has shown that increasing positive behavior is the thing that is most likely going to change behavior. It isn't so much trying to get rid of the bad stuff, but it's increasing the good stuff. So when you increase it enough, there isn't a whole lot of room for those undesired behaviors. Although, Increasing the good stuff, reinforcement praise is not as straightforward as it sounds. So positive reinforcement is actually a technical term. Positive doesn't mean nice. It means anything that you are adding to the situation to make a behavior more likely to occur. And this doesn't mean that you are trying to make the good behavior occur more. It is any behavior. Some of the things that are reinforcing are verbal praise, which I think is um, common, uh, smiling, eye contact, behavioral gestures like a thumbs up, talking, yelling, lecturing, anything that is giving your child attention and energy is actually going to increase the chance that that behavior is going to occur. One of the things that parents inadvertently do is accidentally reinforce the behaviors that they don't want to have happen. So while a kid is having a tantrum, refusing to take medication, um, refusing to eat their food, there can be a lot of bargaining that goes on, some pleading, there can be some yelling or lecturing. And then when later on, when the kid is behaving well, doing what they're supposed to be doing, the parent is like, whew, okay, I can take a break. But now what's happened is all of a sudden, all of the energy and all of the attention has gone to that behavior that we don't want to see. 
I hate the phrase that kids are looking for negative attention because that's that's not true. Kids are respond to energy and respond to attention. It isn't that they crave it. It isn't that they're trying to be manipulative. It is the, the way that our brains are designed that they, by not on purpose, they will do the thing that brings that energy and tension. So trying to change behavior means that you have to be really conscious of what you are reinforcing. Next slide. One of the main ways to reinforce is to give praise. And again, this isn't quite as straightforward as, as it sounds. It is really important to give praise in a immediately after a desired behavior happens and to be really sin sincere sincere and enthusiastic about it. You have to be specific and you have to acknowledge even small steps. You're not looking for protection for perfection. Any time that the kid is doing something that you're wanting to do, they, they take a tiny little bite of food, they bring the, the medication closer to their mouth, those are the times to praise. Some of the things that the pitfalls that parents fall into is to put a little sarcasm. Finally, you ate your, your food that finally actually turns it into a bit of a punishment and makes it less likely that that behavior is gonna happen in the future. Tacking on a lesson at the end, I am so excited for you that you ate your food. See how easy that was? Maybe next time you don't have to wait so long. That lesson at the end, again, takes away from that praise. It becomes a bit of a punishment and you have gotten rid of any of that, that reinforcement process. Um, Reflective listening is a way to teach a child to vocalize their um, emotional concerns as opposed to act out. And it is things like saying, I can see that you, you really don't want to, to have that medication and it's really important that you take it. The and statement is something that you can use instead of but it's really important because it teaches the child that you can, you can be upset and you can not like something and you can take it at the same time. You don't have to choose between those two things. Next slide. Selective attention is um, ignoring, ignoring behaviors that you don't want to, um, that, that you don't want to see, those undesirable behaviors. That can be the, the tantrums, that can be the bargaining, that can be uh, the whining about taking any sort of medication. But it's not just ignoring. So what you need to do is pick out the things that are are not worth paying attention to. And it's, it's going to be the um, making nasty, uh, making bad faces or being a little snide when you're trying to, when it's time to take medication or when it's time to um, have some food or something like that making a provocative comment to try to get a rise out of you, to try to start an argument with you so that they can argue as opposed to have to focus on the thing that they want to do. One of the things with ignoring is it's, it's actually quite hard to ignore behavior. Because if you remember what we talked about before is that any reinforcing behaviors are really vast. It's anything that can give the kid a reaction or attention. So if you're sighing, talking under your breath, if you're rolling your eyes, if your, your body language is, is showing some sort of reaction, you're actually not ignoring, you are reinforcing the behavior. So trying to have that calm, neutral, outside look, no matter how you're feeling on the inside, is, is what's really important. And then the second that you see some of that desired behavior, you turn that attention back on. It may be that the, the kid is whining about having to eat some food. You might um, turn away, look at your phone, just um, slowly deep breathe for a little bit. The second that they start to bring the food towards their mouth, even if they're smelling it, you give them some praise. This, that probably is gonna last for about two seconds. Put the food back down, start whining again. You start to, um, you start to ignore. This is not an easy thing to do. It sounds simple, but it's not. If you, want to, if you want to address the behavior, you can do it in one very short sentence. Um, it is not acceptable to throw food. It is not acceptable to hit me. Um, well, not the hitting one, that one 
we'll talk about it in a second. Um, you can make that statement, but make sure you're not doing any lecturing, and it's just that that one statement. We can we can continue to talk after you take that bite, or we continue to talk after you come back to coffee. Um, when you ignore, most likely the behavior is going to escalate because kids have learned how to get a reaction, how to get energy from you over, over their lives. When you start to do something a little bit different, they're gonna be like, hey, how come, you're not, how come this isn't working? How come you're not giving me attention when I do this? And they're gonna try to up it a little bit until they realize, again, this isn't really a conscious thing, until they realize that, that the game has changed and they have to do that desired behavior in order to get your attention. Next page. One really great way of keeping track of behaviors is behavior plan. This is as much for the parent as it is for the kid, just to, to reinforce that, that consistency. I'm not gonna go too much into it, but I do wanna point out a couple of pitfalls that the parents fall into when they try to create these. Um, the first one is that the target behavior, I've had just a couple of target behaviors, one to three, no more than that. The, you need to be very consistent about um, using the plan, offering the rewards. Um, it's really important to come up with the rewards together with the child to have them invested in it. The older the child is, the more involved they need to be in picking the behaviors that they're going to work on, picking the rewards. There needs to be some daily rewards because um, especially young kids, a reward that happens three days after a behavior is not going to, they're not going to connect the dots. They're not going to be able to do those things. Um, also, it can be really tempting to give a spontaneous reward um, just because we like to do that as parents. But if you're using this chart, you need to stick to it as designed. Okay, next page. There are times when you need to use reprimands or consequences, but I really need to stress that reprimands and consequences, punishments are the least effective way to change behavior. They, so what happens is you're teaching a kid what not to do, but they don't necessarily naturally know what they're supposed to put to replace it with. So anytime that you give a reprimand or anytime that you give a consequence, you have to be very specific about what they did wrong and very specific about what you want to see instead. Again, this consistency, you need to decide what behaviors you're going to reprimand and what behaviors you're going to ignore and which ones you're um, going to just let go. If you need to give a consequence, it needs to be immediately after. Um, waiting for an hour to, to give some sort of punishment isn't going to work. The kids aren't going to connect the dots necessarily. The, the neurons in their brain aren't, con aren't going to connect that this is a bad thing. And the punishment or consequence needs to be related to the behavior. So let's say they, um, they hit a nurse that taking away a phone is not at all related to, to physical violence and it is going to be less effective than if you have some sort of consequence that is related to what they did. So perhaps um, a consequence might be that they need to compose a um, apology letter or write a card before they can have a do their electronics. So the consequence isn't actually taking away the electronics, but doing something related to making up for the behavior they engaged in. Okay, next slide. In addition to dealing with specific behaviors, it is there are things that you can do to generally increase um, everyday enjoyment and quality of life. Having things that are comforting in the hospital or around the house, which can be a teddy bear or a blanket, engaging in distraction when, um, when in the hospital, when in pain, when there's a lot of physical side effects. It is okay if your kids have increased screen time if they're in the hospital, if they're in the midst of a crisis. It's that distraction is actually something that can help them get through it. Uh, sometimes when kids are having a crisis, I hear parents say, you know, he can focus on that, that screen, so he must be feeling okay. When he's playing that video game, he's saying the pain is less. That is actually a biological thing because when you're not focused on that pain, when you're having that distraction, you actually don't notice it. So that 
it's not that they are being manipulative or lying about being able to engage in other activities. They really do feel less pain, less discomfort when they're distracted from it. Other things such as going on walks, journaling, exercising, support groups can also be really helpful. Almost done. Next. There are going to be times when you'll need to, when you've done your best to help your child cope with um, dealing with disease or dealing with side effects, there are going to be times when you need to get extra professional help, um, either formal psychotherapy or medication from a, a psychiatrist. I want to stress that this is not a reflection that the kid is has failed to be able to cope with the situation. It is not a reflection of the parents being able to, to help the kid cope. It is a very common and related thing when dealing with chronic illness or when dealing with cancer. Okay, next, next slide. So I wanted to bring, I want to bring it back to, to parents is a lot of this is falling on you being able to be consistent to model, um, model being able to deal with challenging emotions, model being able to handle anger and sadness, acknowledge that it's there and that we can have good lives and still do things even when it's there. And with all of that responsibility can feel quite overwhelming. And I wanna end on recognizing that you do not have to be perfect, just like your kid isn't gonna be perfect. I teach this, this parenting stuff and I am far from perfect when it comes to being a parent. Consistency is tough. Um, all you have to do is make sure that you are good enough. All right, thank you. Thank you, Karen, that was excellent. Um, I just wanna open the floor up if, we, if anyone has any questions. You can unmute yourself. Sue, it's Karen. I just wanna um, take a moment to thank everybody for the presentation. This was very, very good. Yes, I echo Karen. Uh, Karen's uh, comments. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, if there aren't any questions, then um, the panelists' information is here. Please feel free to get in touch with any of us or uh, Jenny or myself. And uh, thank you for participating tonight and let us know if you need anything. Thank you. Uh, the last thing I do want to say is, as Karen said, it really does take a village. We have our pharmacy, we have our nutritionists, we have our counseling, and it really does take a village to get through um, some of the situations we have in our chronic illness and our cancer populations, and even just raising children. So please contact us if you have any questions or need anything from us. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone.